Okay, Ms. Duncan and I are here to do the final lecture. Yay! For, yay! For chapter three, part four. And this is where we go into detail about the cycling, the biogeochemical cycles. Um, so let's talk first of all about the global recycling. When we talk about sustainability, we're modeling it after the Earth. Because in essence, the, the little Earth being our little spaceship in our solar system, in our galaxy, in our universe, is completely and totally self-sufficient and has been and continues to be. So how does this happen? Well, nothing is ever used up or blown away. It's always recycled. It's always reused. And these different cycles are what allow everything on the planet to continue. Um, so what exactly is a nutrient? And we can talk about nutrients all the time, and we've got to give a definition for it. So a nutrient is an element or a compound that's useful for living. If I don't need it to live, it's not a nutrient. For example, um, I don't need, what's something I don't need? I think it's something I don't need. Mm. Can you all think of something I don't need? What don't I need? In the way of, in the way of something that's abiotic. Um, I guess I need everything. <laughs> what What is not a nutrient for me? Um, go to your vitamin jar and take a look at everything that's listed on there, all of the minerals and stuff. I know it's not a nutrient. Mercury. Mercury is not a nutrient. It's actually a toxin. So it's not going to fall into this category of nutrients. But um, something like I, phosphorus would be, and um, iron would be a nutrient. Um, and so all of these things that the uh, organisms need to live are called nutrients. And with the biogeochemical cycle, it's these nutrients that are going through air and water and soil and rock and living organisms. So when the activity that we did with the, with the nitrogen cycle, there was a lot of it that didn't go through a living organism. Like when, can you it remember? It went into ocean water. Yeah, it goes from a stream into ocean water. That doesn't involve an organism, so it's not part of the cycle. Um, so let's take a look at the water cycle. We all love the water cycle. We're all very familiar with the water cycle. So you, you have the gist of it because you've been studying this since you were in literally elementary, elementary school. school yep. Right. You know, so we know it rains and the itsy bitsy spider comes back out again when the sun comes out and it dries up all the rain. It goes back into the sky and it rains again. So this is the water cycle, but it's just a little more complicated than that. So because you're big kids now, we're going to introduce the complications. These are the complications. You have aquifers. An aquifer is found underground. underground. And so the water will sometimes run off, and it forms what's called runoff. That should be easy <laughs> to remember. And if it's a runoff on the surface, it's called surface runoff, which could be very, very rapid or very, very slow. Or it can literally just kind of sink down into the ground. And that sinking down into the ground is called infiltration. It'll infiltrate and then percolate through the soil, which means essentially moving through the soil. And then this groundwater is going to be very, very slow and moving. And we'll talk more about aquifers in another chapter. But right now, all you really need to know is that part of the water cycle includes all the water underground that you don't see that's still there. And this will eventually end up either directly into a a lake or a pond where it might be evaporated, or it could literally travel all the way down to the ocean. The other part of the water cycle that we've talked about, but that you didn't learn about in elementary school, was transpiration from the plants. So you know that it evaporates from the land, and you know it evaporates from the bodies of water, but it also comes from the trees. So for this reason, trees can greatly affect the local climate. And if you take out too many trees, you can take an area that is at one time a forest and then change it into something completely and totally different. It's more of a problem in arid areas where you don't get a lot of rain. So a couple of examples would be um, out in California. We were out in California this summer, and they had an awful lot of logging in the early part of the century because they had to use the trees to shore up the gold mines for the gold rush but they didn't plant them back. And they took out so many because it was already an arid area 
they never got enough water to support those trees. So what they ended up then was with a savanna, with grassland and just a few trees here and there. It, it, it was beautiful, but it was, it was at one time a forest. So they completely destroyed the ecosystem. Uh, another example is places in the Middle East where it was clear by looking at fossils of animals or waste piles from people and, and the way that people um, lived. They're very interesting study on um, plaster, which requires wood to manufacture because you have to bring the raw material up to an incredibly high heat to get a really high quality plaster. So that meant that at one time there were trees. And as the archaeology gets younger and younger and younger, the plaster gets worse and worse and worse to the point where it's basically whitewash. And part of the reason was because they used up their resources, just like an Easter Island. But because it was an arid area, the trees never really did recover. So now it's a, a lot of it is just a parched desert or a savanna or grassland when at one time it was forced. So the transpiration from the trees is huge. If you want to increase the amount of water in your area, you can plant more trees. That will help a lot. I'm, I'm a big hugger of trees, Miss <laughs> Duncan. That's, and most people don't know that. That was That's something new that a lot of people don't realize that trees can produce more water, help to produce more water and be a big part of the water cycle. And I thought you were saying that people didn't realize it was a big tree hugger. So. I would have guessed that. You would have actually. guessed that. Okay, yeah. yeah. Every time I go someplace, there's a tree I just Take a picture of me hugging it. I know it's so disgusting. Anyway, okay, so let's, the water cycle. How do we change it? Well, we just discussed one big way, which was... Clearing the vegetation, clearing the trees. Getting rid of the trees. And this opens up the soil to erosion. That's going to pollute groundwater. And then, again, another way that we affect it is... Whoa, back, Simba. There we go. We can pollute the underground water as well, which is also going to affect the water cycle. Um, and then if we take away too much fresh water, that's going to affect it. What if we dam up a river and now we have a huge lake that's got a lot of surface area? Is that going to affect the water cycle? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it does because all of a sudden now you've increased the amount of evaporation. And you decrease, if you if you dammed a river now, you've opened up a lot of that river water to evaporation where it wasn't opened up to it before. So there are all different kinds of ways that we affect the water cycle. Um, another cycle is the carbon cycle. And the carbon cycle is not terribly complicated. But if we take a look at it, and this is rather an interesting picture because it tends to be rather complicated. One of the biggest ways that humans release carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere is by burning things. So if we burn fossil fuels or we burn trees, they were going to be releasing the carbon dioxide back into the air. So this can be a problem, depending on who you talk to. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> um, so you burn coal and you burn natural gas and you, you burn the fossil fuels, then you're releasing extra carbon dioxide into the air that wasn't there before. And if you burn plants, then, you know, like a forest, a forest fire is going to release CO2 into the air. Um, and so then you've got all the CO2 in the atmosphere. So what, where does it go from there? Well, actually, it has places to go. Plants use it. Plants absolutely use it. So that's uh, what we would call a carbon dioxide sink, which is like a big storage area for carbon dioxide. So the plants will absorb the carbon dioxide, and that's a big sink for CO2. And then other places where it might be used. In water? Yep. As water, rainwater goes through the air, it will dissolve carbon dioxide and make it slightly acidic when it forms carb carbonic acid. So that's why our pond water and our river water and our lake water is always slightly acidic. Our rainwater is too. Um, and it will be absorbed in the ocean. And what's the interesting thing about the ocean that a lot of people don't realize is that the ocean will absorb and outgas carbon dioxide depending on whether it's warm or if it's cold. So if it's cold, it will dissolve more CO2. And if it's warm, it releases more CO2. So if you go back to your gas laws, for those of you that took chemistry, <laughs> you're nothing. <laughs> gas laws. You go back to your gas laws, and even for those of you that did not take chemistry, 
you go back to your gas laws, a warm liquid will take a gas that already has a whole bunch of energy in those molecules anyway, which is why it's a gas, and give it more energy. And so what happens is that, that energy from the warm liquid is transferred into those gas molecules and they get escape velocity and they just hop right out. So if you heat up a liquid, you drive off the gases. Conversely, if you cool it off, then as those gas molecules strike the surface of the water, they will slow down and stick and then get dissolved down into the water and stay in there. So you have more gases dissolved in cold water than you do in warm water, which is why thermal pollution can be an issue because if your water gets too warm, it dries out the oxygen and then your animals die. Um, so you're going to find a ton of carbon dioxide in the ocean. It's the, obviously, since it's over 70% of the surface of the planet, that is the biggest carbon dioxide sink, and that should not be minimized by any stretch. Um, and so then another one here that it mentions is um, soil water, which is bizarre, called dissolved carbon dioxide in the water that's incorporated in the soil. I, you know, I can't believe that's a whole lot. Can you really? No, I wouldn't think so. No, I, I wouldn't think so. And then animals, we all have carbon in them. We, you know, we actually are made of carbon. Carbon. Right? <laughs> okay. So we're a carbon sink. Um, and when we exhale, we... Release carbon dioxide. Yes, we are definitely a big source of carbon dioxide as well. <laughs> Excuse me. And unlike the plants who take it in at night, <laughs> we just exhale it. So, you know, we're, we're dirty as far as our carbon dioxide usage is concerned. And then you've got uh, other fossil fuels that absorb it. And, and rocks. You've, you've got a lot of carbon in rocks. Now, can you think of any rocks that have carbon in them? Limestone. Limestone is absolutely full of it. And, of course, limestone is made of the shells of dead animals, right? Right. Sign mostly limestone, a lot of limestone in the oceans, on the ocean surfaces. So that makes sense. Exactly. So you're going to have a lot of carbon that's going to be tied up in the rocks, too. Um, so you've got all of these places where the carbon is going to be formed and going to be released. So in a natural carbon dioxide cycle, you're going to have naturally given off by plants and naturally given off by animals, naturally given off by the ocean. There's going to be some probably ejected in a volcanic eruption. Uh, it's given off in the form of, of when decay, when things decay. You've got the aerobic bacteria that are breaking everything down into carbon, carbon dioxide. dioxide. Um, and as the rocks weather, they're also going to release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So this is your carbon cycle. Um, and then you, there are those who will argue that by burning fossil fuels, you disrupt the carbon cycle by adding too much carbon. And the consequence of that is heating of the atmosphere, or some people would say. Um, so what are the effects of human activities in the carbon cycle? We add excess CO2 by burning fossil fuels and cleaning any, clearing any kind of vegetation that would absorb it, basically, from the air. And I, I love the Hummer there. That's like, that's a political statement when you say, <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Hummer people. I guess you're supposed to feel guilty. I don't know. Okay. The nitrogen cycle. Our personal favorite is the nitrogen cycle. Now, unfortunately, my computer is being ornery. And it will not let me write out the different things. So, and I don't have this on the smart board because I can't record the sound loud enough. So I'm kind of caught here. I can't really draw anything for you yet. Maybe if I can find a class pad that still has a battery that's working, I could do something with a class pad. Um, or maybe I could even buy one. But um, bar, bar that, right now I'm having issues. So let's take a look at the nitrogen cycle. So we did that activity today. And from that activity, what, what were some of the things that you picked up from the activity about the nitrogen cycle? That it goes through a lot of different paths. There's no just single one path that it moves through. Yeah. Um, so there's not a set sequence of events that it occurs or goes through. It goes all, all different ways and in all different forms. Exactly. So you look at this and you think it should be one big circle, but it's not at all. And you can have it in an aquatic ecosystem as well as a terrestrial ecosystem because the activity that we did was aquatic. Um, was there anything else that you picked up on that? Well, like you said, there was a bunch of stuff that went on that wasn't necessarily biogeochemical, like lightning, for example, and um, 
going from the fresh water to the, the ocean water dissolving it. Exactly. So do you have any particular questions about this that things you didn't quite get about it? No. Something a student might ask? Something a student has asked. Any questions a student might have asked? What's the difference between nitrification and, and nitrogen fixing? Or nitrifying and denitrifying, which is where you think, wow, these should be opposites, but they aren't. And ammoniification, that has been a question. What's the difference between it and any of the other Another things, right. exactly. And then you've got the two A words. You have a modification and assimilation. assimilation. So how do you keep those straight? Um, so that's a good question. Assimilation is when the nitrogen-containing compound is consumed by either a plant, by uptaking its roots, or by an animal consuming a plant, or another animal. And they don't have that drawn here, but if this if this little squirrely chip monkey thing were to eat a bug there's carbon in the bug i mean there's nitrogen in the bug right because we can assume the bug has got amino acids it's got proteins i mean i know it's got protein because you can eat bug and get protein so it's got protein um so assimilation would include the animal eating the plant and the bug um now notice here that when the plants die they're broken down by decomposers and what do the decomposers make Ammonium. Ammonium, and they also make ammonia, even though it's not on here. And the big difference between ammonium and ammonia is ammonium has an extra proton on it, which gives it a positive charge. And ammonia does not. So ammonium, you're never going to find by itself. It's, it's, an, it's an ion. And I, I say you're never going to find it by itself. You, you probably could, but it's got a charge on it. Ammonia is a gas, and it's neutral. So they even actually have two different... Um, physical properties. But the decomposers break down waste, they get ammonia or ammonium, and that process is ammonification. You can also get ammonification when you have your nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil that take nitrogen from the air and make it into a, a, some kind of a substance, either a, nit well, a nitrate um, or can take it and make it directly into ammonia as well. Um, nitrogen fixing is taking the nitrogen in the air, back simple, nitrogen in the air and putting it into a form that can be used by plants and animals. And that's nitrogen fixing. So you have to have bacteria that do that. And then the bacteria are going to take that nitrogen and they're either going to break it down into um, ammonia, which is usually the next step. So you'll get ammonia that plants can take up, but there's a problem with ammonium plants can take up. There's a problem with ammonia, it tends to be toxic. So taking the nitrogen from the air and making it into a substance or a form that the plants can use is called nitrogen fixing. If you have a nitrogen compound that is changed into ammonia, it's called ammonification. But then the ammonia has to be broken broken down. And you have bacteria and you say, how do the bacteria do that? Go ahead and ask me. How does the bacteria do that? I'm Dr. so glad you asked that question, Miss Duncan. They do it because they literally eat the compounds and whatever they produce is the form of waste is what comes out. So the decomposers eat the compounds and their waste is ammonia. What's interesting is that human waste will convert to ammonia as well. Um, and so you have the bacteria that break down the waste and convert it into ammonia. Then you have other bacteria that like the ammonia and they think it's tasty, so they eat it. And when they do, they first give off nitrites, which are also toxic. And then you have more conversion going on to form the nitrates. Now this is the magic, this is the magic compound right there. That's the thing that everybody loves is the nitrate. Notice that nitrate is an ion. This one's got this negative charge right there. And it's got one more oxygen than nitrite, which only has two. And so taking this ammonia and changing it into first nitrite and then nitrate is called nitrifying it, nitrification. I don't know why, it just is. <laughs> then if you take the nitrates and you change it back into nitrogen by getting rid of the oxygen, so you have more bacteria that will eat this 
and then in response they spit out nitrogen as a byproduct and we don't care what it does with the oxygen really because it's not important to the nitrogen cycle um, it's called denitrification and all these bacteria are different types of bacteria mm -hmm. that like doing different things or like different forms of yeah. the nitrogen yeah they're all different species that do it different ways um, and so it's really kind of interesting how it all evolved to kind of fit together but you know all those bacteria not all those bacteria but many of those bacteria are actually used in wastewater treatment plants so if you go which we probably won't be able to do because there's too many of us but if we were to go to a wastewater treatment plant they always have a biologist on staff there because the biologist understands the biochemistry and managing the bacteria it's all about the bugs at a wastewater treatment plant the ones that do this whole nitrogen cycle thingy um, so if you want more information here is the uh, source that I got that diagram from I liked it a lot better than the one that was in the book you can just click and this is a hyperlink oh look very cool click on the hyperlink and it'll take you um, wow and maybe it won't maybe I have to go back and double check that link oops okay I'll fix that I promise um, but I got it from the EPA website okay so what are the effects what do we do well we make fertilizer and that's a problem because we never seem to add the right amount of fertilizer it's always too much you ever been in these neighborhoods where they've had the lawn guys go by and they sprinkle this dry fertilizer and it ends up all over the sidewalk and all over the street and all over the driveway yes I've seen that yeah well that's bad because that all washes down into the water so that's affecting the nitrogen cycle right there another thing that and see there you go contaminating groundwater and fresh water and surface runoff water from nitrate ions and inorganic fertilizers now if you take down the forest you know I have to go back and double check this one because I'm not sure exactly how that works how does burning down a tree release nitrogen into the troposphere I don't know darn you know every once in a while I come across a sentence I'll say to myself I got to go back and reinvestigate that and I never do I need to figure that one out um, but it does add gases that contribute to acid rain because nitrogen oxide will combine with water to form nitric acid and nitrogen oxide is given off by incomplete combustion a lot of times from organic compounds um, so it's given off in the tailpipe of your car in burning fossil fuels in factories they all have nitrogen in them so they're going to oxidize and release nitrogen oxides and then that does nasty stuff to the air so all kinds of stuff so production of fertilizers will fix more nitrogen than all of the natural sources combined this is the reason why there's enough food to feed 7 billion people on the planet because without this we never would have gotten up to 7 billion people because the people who couldn't afford to grow food would have died from starvation which is a very sad thing to say but that's pretty much the case so because we have these artificial fertilizers that artificially fix the nitrogen we um, we can feed everybody on the planet phosphorus cycle what's guano do you know what that is it's poop ain't it yeah it sure as heck is <laughs> a fancy word <laughs> for bird poop and bat poop bad poop too um, and in fact the a lot of the phosphorus mines around are under bats yeah it's or places that used to have bats but don't anymore um, the interesting thing about the phosphorus cycle is that it there is no atmospheric component there is no compound of phosphorus that ends up in the air somehow so with nitrogen it's you know clearly nitrogen gas and miscellaneous nitrogen oxygen gases carbon it's clearly carbon dioxide water you know like half its life is spent in the air um, and then sulfur as well ends up in the air but phosphorus does not have an atmospheric component it is the only biogeochemical cycle that doesn't have any component in the air so expect that as a test question um, so where do you find it if you don't find it in the air well we established that we find it in bird poo find it in rocks 
Find it in rocks. There are a lot of different rocks that have phosphate. In fact, most of the phosphorus that we get for our fertilizer comes from rocks. And we also find it in autotrophs, producers, yep. plants. Exactly, because all of those things have to have phosphorus. It's considered it's a nutrient. Um, and it's a macronutrient for plants because when you buy fertilizer, for, for, <laughs> it's been a long day. It's been a long day. <laughs> When you buy fertilizer, it's got an NPK number, and the N stands for nitrogen, and the K stands for potassium, and the P stands for phosphorus. Exactly. So it's a macronutrient. So you got to get the, the phosphorus that usually comes from rocks, and it's going to be in the plants. Obviously, they have to have it. And then because consumers eat plants, we have it in us too. So sources of phosphorus include fertilizer, which would be how we disrupt it. The, the phosphorus cycle. Um, Land-based food webs that go through death and decomposition and then it ends up dissolved in soil, water, lakes, and rivers and then the stuff that's dissolved in the soil will be taken back up again by the autotrophs which will be consumed by the consumatrophs <laughs> and then die again. again. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the rocks, the rocks will weather and that will release the phosphorus, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. The marine sediments, and this is interesting, too, because a lot of the stuff falls, goes into the ocean. And the ocean animals and plants eat it as well. And so when they die, death decomposition, they either get dissolved back into the water, or sometimes frequently they are included into the sediments, usually like the shells and the bones and stuff. Like... Um, yeah, the shells and the bones and the stuff. So that ends up down in, in the sediments. And then if you've got any kind of geologic uplifting, it's going to bring those rocks back up again, and then they're going to weather. weather. Yeah. So you can see that a phosphorus atom could spend a few hundred million years in a rock before it ever sees the surface again. So this is a really, really slow cycle. Um, and unfortunately, of course, we disrupt it. And the biggest way that we do is by adding fertilizer. But what's interesting is that we put or have put in the past phosphates in our detergents. And so if you look now, you'll see that all of our liquid laundry detergents should say contains no phosphates. And the reason for that is because the phosphorus would cause algae blooms because it's a, a nutrient to plants. So it just made them go, you know, and then, and then the water would be all nasty. And so we had to take the phosphates out of our water. Um, if you clear the soils in tropical forests, you're going to reduce the amount of phosphorus because that's, it's the, the plant detritus is what puts it back into the soil. Um, and then, of course, if we take rocks out of the ground to make into fertilizer, we're going to mess it up there, too. Is this our last cycle? It is. Oh, yay. Okay, sulfur. So we did these kind of in order of importance with water being the first most important and sulfur being the least important, but you do need to be familiar with it. The biggest thing to know is that the primary natural source of sulfur in the environment is... Volcanoes. Right, which you personally know a lot about. I do. Exactly. So unfortunately, in this course, we're not going to spend a lot of time studying volcanoes. That would be my dream job. You know, I was going to do that, didn't you? That was, no, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I married somebody who kept me in Georgia, and there weren't any volcanoes. <laughs> volcanoes here, yep. Right, yeah. I really wanted to go out west, but I chose him instead. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> well, I'm still married, so I guess maybe it was a good decision. Sometimes I think the jury is out because I do miss those volcanoes. But anyway, they can get a little testy, so maybe it's just as well. Um, but they're the primary source of sulfur in the atmosphere. So when a volcano erupts, it's going to release all these nasty sulfur compounds into the air, usually in the form of sulfur dioxide. And sulfur dioxide will form sulfur trioxide. They also release hydrogen sulfide. Where did we hear about the hydrogen sulfide? That was where? In the swamps. In the swamps, yeah, same stuff. So you're going to get hydrogen uh, sulfide from the anaerobic decay of plant matter which is why you find it in the swamp. Now, I think this is particularly interesting how we have this random rabbit <laughs> sitting in the middle of the field. But there it is for all to enjoy, the random rabbit, which apparently 
I guess this is decaying matter. Would that be his rabbit pellets? Maybe. I guess. I guess. I, they will. You know, they actually they are not stinky. Speaking from personal experience, the urine that's another story. With the pellets, not so bad. Um, but they will decay and release sulfur. Um, and then the decomposing will release hydrogen sulfide gas, which can become sulfur. And so then you get your sulfate salts, which include things like uh, sulfate. So, you know, it's SO4 is sulfate. So you're going to get things like sodium sulfate, potassium sulfate, calcium sulfate. Those would be your sulfate salts. Um, and then these are going to be consumed by the plants. Now, this is like a micronutrient. They don't need a lot of sulfur, really. Uh, oh, would you stop? Stop. Go back. Thank you. Um, now, the problem with all of this is it's kind of a nice, clean little cycle, except, of course, we have to mess everything up. So when we burn coal especially, it releases a ton of sulfur into the air, which causes acid rain, which causes acid fog and acid precipitation, which kills a lot of our plants. So that's a problem. Um, another source is any, a lot of the different types of industries that we have will release sulfur as a byproduct. Some of that sulfur will actually be made into sulfur compounds that we can use. And then a lot of it is just released in the air in the form of sulfur dioxide, which is a gas. A lot of that has to be scrubbed out. Um, you know why you have catalytic converter on your car? Do you know what that's for? It's to clean the sulfur out. Exactly, exactly. So if it ever goes bad, you ever had a bad one? I have not. Oh, Thank you're goodness. lucky. Yeah, because they ain't cheap. <laughs> that's what I've heard. <laughs> yeah. But they, uh, you can always tell when they go bad. You know why? They smell like sulfur. Do they really? Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, they give off that, that distinctive swampy hydrogen sulfide smell. Um, so that's the whole purpose of that. So you burn fossil fuels, you get sulfur also. Um, sulfur dioxide can combine in the air with oxygen to form sulfur trioxide, which is a major component of photochemical smog. So it's nastiness. And if it combines with water, then you can get sulfuric acid. And we all know about sulfuric acid. That's what you find in the battery in your car. So it's really really bad and then if it combines with that ammonia that we were talking about the toxic ammonia that can be given off by decom decomposition which is a gas if it combines with that then you end up with ammonium sulfate which can form uh, acid precipitation or acid deposition technically is what they call where this this stuff will actually just come right out and just kind of deposit itself on surfaces it's just kind of nasty so that is the sulfur cycle we do have the ocean so, you know, you have runoff that goes into the ocean and animals in the ocean that will uptake some sulfur. So, we add sulfur dioxide to the air by burning fossil, fossil fuels. Exactly, primarily coal. Yeah, refining uh, petroleum, oil. You end up with sulfur compounds. And then, this is another one that you probably know a lot about too, since you teach your systems and rocks and stuff. And that is the metallic ores. So, we've got things like... Um, our copper ore and our iron ore and our lead ore, they all are sulfates. They're, you know, galena is lead sulfate, and or is it lead sulfide? I think it's lead sulfide. PB, PBS would be lead sulfide. It's also a, a network on television. Um, anyway, uh, and then pyrite is iron sulfide, and chalcopyrite is copper sulfide, and so all of these, all of these things that are ores have sulfur in them. So you got to get rid of the sulfur right. so you can get the metal, um, and so that's going to release sulfur into the air as well. Ah, oh, yes, we're done. We're done. We're done. Okay. So you've got a test coming up. Be sure that you study that. Be sure that you read. Be sure that you know your vocab, and be sure to ask Ms. Duncan or me if you have any questions at all. Have anything you want to add? Enjoy. Yeah, thanks. Bye.